go into that a little bit about what happened, the the event, if you don't mind, uh, the, sure. th- what happens. I mean, how did it, and how did it all start? And well, my wife and I were home. It was June twelfth this year of this, this year, mm-hmm. and it was a Sunday evening, and uh, I was actually folding porch fest brochures mm-hmm. in the living room, and Christy, my wife, um, she said, "Did you hear the car in the driveway?" And I says, "No." And I look out there, and I says, "There's no car there." And um, I says, "Okay." Well, and we went back to. The live, sitting in the living room, and then it was about maybe a minute or two later, we heard a crash. And at the base of our driveway, it's a long hill. Um, was, we thought some, and there's been numerous crashes there before. And so we go out on the deck to check to see do we need to call 911? Does somebody need medical help? And we looked out, and this car crashed, and this guy's coming up the driveway. But the thing we noticed immediately was carrying a sawed off shotgun with him. And that's the only thing he had in his hands was a sawed off shotgun. And, of course, at that time, then just immediately your brain just becomes like a supercomputer. And it's just, what are you going to do now? Mm-hmm. So you know that somebody carries a shotgun with you. It's probably not like any end well. And so we were up on the deck looking out over him. And he says, we had two trucks in the driveway. One was Christie's truck with my truck. And um, it's a Blue Canyon, which is a shop truck. And it's got row motors all over the side of it. But if you look at them in the, the tailgates, it was the only thing you could see. And they both look like GMC Canyons. And he, so he came up the driveway and he says, I want the truck, I want the truck. And we could look down we could see this crash car at the base of the driveway. And that's, we knew that was the issue. We did not know the, the whole story behind it because that was, we were looking at it only from that particular vantage point. And so he got to the base of the driveway and he said, I want the blue truck. And then I'm thinking, okay, Christy was on the left, I was on the right. Um, and we're kind of like, okay, and then all of a sudden, this big blast goes off. And I can still picture the, the flash of light with the muzzle of the, sh- the barrel of the shotgun and heard this. Um, I did not hear anything where the slug landed, which will go in just a second. But um, we heard the shotgun blast, and my ears rang for an hour afterwards. Mm-hmm. It was loud. And so I says, okay, I'm going to get the keys. But what I was afraid of, and I, I probably was slow in the leaving, because I was afraid of leaving Christy on the deck. Because mm-hmm. I go in the house to find the keys. And in our house, we're not probably the most organized with our keys. <laughs> I don't know, you know. It's, it's Who kinda, is? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where they put those keys? You know, it's yeah, like, okay. Yeah. And it could be numerous places. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I found the keys relatively quickly. And so in the meantime, he'd come up on our deck and walked in the house past Christy. And I threw the keys to him. I, and he was carrying the shotgun. And... It just, he grabbed the keys and he drove off. And we have two dogs, um, which we talked about. Mm-hmm. He, and they were both just ran out. Hope wanted to go with the guy. Okay. <laughs> and um, so It looks like you need some comfort, <laughs> pal. I'm coming <laughs> with you. <laughs> so, just, um, and he drove off in the truck. And I went inside, obviously, and called 911 right there. And um, the neighbor had called in. And I did not know this. You know, you only in our story, you only hear part of the story because you don't know what's happening in the rest of the part. Right. So it turns out that the car that he had was wrecked in our driveway was the we were the third one that he'd stolen. So that was a stolen car in our driveway, and um, it, it was his row motors all up the side of it. So he says, "What's the license plate number?" I said, "I don't know the license plate number. You don't need it. Just look for <laughs> row motors. It's all over the side of that truck. Yeah. You can't miss it." Yeah, and so he. Um, but the neighbor had called in and said, there's been a shooting at the house above us. I don't know what's going on, but I heard somebody say, don't shoot. Yeah. And that was Christy. And um, and Christy was so calm throughout. And we both were. But, I mean, she was so calm throughout the whole process. Um, you know, and um, I was really proud of her. And it just happened so quickly. I mean, this whole thing probably was happened, done in three minutes. Yeah. I don't think it, was, it took that long. Yeah. And... Since then, you, know, you replay your event literally millions of times. What would you have done differently? And I don't think I'd do a lot differently. Yeah, Got more cameras at the house, more lighting, but that wouldn't have changed anything. Yeah. It's just a case of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And it turns out, you know, that, um, they, they haven't convicted the person, but, you know, he's, there's a lot of trauma from other people, mm-hmm. from us. Um, and the police reached out to us afterwards, the next day, actually, and suggested, you know, 
how are you doing? I says, great, no big deal. He says, okay. He says, um, but he says, you might need some help. And he says, if you do, call me. And he says, I'll find some help for you. And I says, you know, we're doing okay. And he says, I've never, he says, I've been with the police department for 32 years. And he says, it's never happened to me. Mm-hmm. And um, I says, okay. And so that weekend, because that was on a Sunday, and the weekend we just, I called him, called him back on that following Monday and just says, you know what, I'm not doing so well. And neither is Christy. And so I reached out for some, a person of talent and mm-hmm. helps with trauma. And it was really a big, big success yeah. uh, for us. And just the, the image is still there. Uh, we still, his, he's not been convicted. It's still, he's in jail. And I don't know if he'll go to trial. And it's just going through the legal process. Right. But you had said to me, do you remember what it was that you said exactly? You said that you would just like the opportunity to talk to him. You know, I've written his, um, I I think he's going to go to trial. He's going to accept a statement. And so when he does, and I've attended every hearing, it's on Zoom, that has happened. And the court has really been good about letting me know. And, and so it's a, it was actually one thirty on Tuesday. And they felt he was going to plead at that time. And if he pleads, the judge would say, okay, you've got X amount of years because it would be a part of a plea agreement. And so I already have my victim's agreement or victim statement written out. Right. And um, it's different than most people's victim yeah, statement. I would imagine. And it's just because of the fact, I says, uh, people say, I want to spend, um, just give me five minutes with that guy in the room. Mm-hmm. And I would like to spend five minutes with that guy in the room. Yeah. But not to tear him apart, but to it, say, okay, what happened to you? Right. You know, where where he, because I've learned later, he's 42 years old, and he spent, and, 17 years in prison already. Mm-hmm. And this is the one they, I mean, I have no reason to think, you know, I mean, they found him with the shotgun. So you always want to be careful about saying, well, this is the guy that did it because he's not been convicted and I right. respect the process. But this is the guy that allegedly um, did the incident. And, mm-hmm. but he's got 17 years in prison already and he's probably looking maybe another 20. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. It could be up to 40 years if the process plays out. Wow. <laughs> but I really would like the opportunity to say, Tell me about your life. You know uh, what happened, and what would what could we learn differently from it? Yeah. What would you th- What do you think it, his response would be? I would say his family structure was probably not non-existent to poor. Yeah, do you? I mean, do you think he'd be open to talking to you? Great question. I would actually love that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably would want to do it after the conviction because I wouldn't want to mess the process up. Right. I don't think I ever will. I may write him a letter when he's in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he'll have an opportunity to hear my victim statement. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, yeah. Interesting. Was he, was he, was his initiative? What was he trying to do by taking all these vehicles? His thing was to confuse the police as far as what, um, what vehicle he was driving to yeah. get away. He was made his, a bad choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his vehicle, was to, his opportunity was to get away at that point. And he just, he, by confusing the police, and the police were very confused. And I get that because they're saying, which car is, it? no, he's not in that car. He's in this car. And it was total confusion that night. Even I can remember hearing the police officers and they were, they were, came right up because they knew that there, there'd been a shooting at the house. But no, you know, I said right away, nope, nobody's been injured. And they says, are you sure? And I says, yeah, I'm sure nobody's been injured. Nobody's been killed. But it missed, when the slug, then, so we came, we talked to the police, we gave them our statement, and, so, you know, the, the whole walkthrough. We never went in the house. And at the time I made the call, I was calling from the house, but I never looked around. So Chris and I came in two, about two hours later, and I says, the door, door had been left open. And I said, oh, boy, I'll tell you, the, the dust really came in. And it turns out that we looked up and we saw a hole through a window in our and so the, the slug of the shotgun went through the window and still embedded in the beam of our house. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, I'm pretty tall. And um, I was about 18 inches above my head uh-huh. uh, between Christy and I. So, uh-huh. I mean, it, and if the slug would hit us, obviously, it was it was a slug. It was not a, yeah. it, was, it would have killed us instantly. Yeah. Wow. It's probably good it wasn't like bird shot or bug shot. You know, I've often, and I thought about that too, yeah. exactly. Would have, which would have been better because if it would have been bird shot, I think I would have gotten a spray in the face. I really do. I, there's, I couldn't see how I could get by without getting sprayed. Yeah. Because well, it was that close. But, well, you know, then I probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have gotten killed though. And so I don't, you know, that's a part of that whole what if process that you play in your minds as far as, you know, what, what would you do in the situation? And the thing I asked myself was, what would I do differently? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't have a gun in the house, and I respect people that do. It's no big deal, but it's it's 
But for me, I wouldn't have time to go get a gun. And some people, well, you would have had a gun. You know, I, if I go on the deck, I'm probably not going to carry a gun. I don't think it would have changed anything, yeah. and I probably would have escalated yeah. um, the at whole that, thing. Yeah, at that moment, there's you're not trying to get into a gunfight. You know, right. <laughs> like and if he's got a shotgun and I got a pistol, I'm probably going to lose that. It's not going to be a good combination there either. So yeah. it played out probably the best way it possibly could have. You know, we have a we have a friend. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but Kelly Sparlin. He's a uh, he owns Rogue Protection Group. He's, okay. he's retired Navy SEAL, Special Forces. Obviously, you mm-hmm. know, spent a lot of time behind behind a weapon, and um, and he studies this kind of stuff, like the the human brain and how it interacts to to um, fear and and combat and in these kinds of situations. The and whole fight or flight. The whole mm-hmm. fight or flight yeah. thing, and um, he says you don't get a choice, yeah. like like you don't get to choose. Right. What happens? Your body does what your brain is going to do what it wants to do. Right. And and you don't get to. So the fact that you guys were like some people just maybe they fight or they freeze or they they run or I mean he's actually one person I want to get on here but he's, he's a super smart guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's 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 interesting your 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 brain just goes in, like you said in super robot mode it just right and it's just the decisions you're processing are you're taking input in. And you're crying, okay, what am I going to do next? And you're thinking of Christy. She's mm-hmm. thinking of me. Mm-hmm. Um, you're thinking of everything, trying to go in. And in the space of this three minutes, I don't think I've ever thought that much in that sort of time. Yeah. And I never will again. No, you, you won't. It's just, right. You can't turn that on. Right. And that's one of the things that he talks about, too, is like you can't train that. Right. And and it's because you just, there's, there's no substitute for it. Like mm-hmm. there's no way. Um, he talks about his first gunfight. I mean, they work for months up to these deployments and to go on to these missions and I mean, preparing and shooting and, and simulating these things. I mean, Lawton was Lawton's a Marine. He, mm-hmm. he understands how all that works. Like they train, well, maybe not, they not, don't train. Not, not to that level. Not to that <laughs> level. I mean, but they, they have these, they call them workups where they have these things before they go and deploy on these, on these missions. And he got into his first gunfight. And the only thing he remembers is his buddy tapping him on the shoulder and being like, Kelly, what are you doing? Get back in the fight. Like he literally <laughs> just, like just mm-hmm. stood there and froze, and I mean, he'd been working for months behind a weapon doing this stuff, and you just you don't get to choose. So it's just it's interesting that your yeah. body went training. Into it's not like you're going to go practice folding letters and you know have a gun under your couch cushion and practice now, and right? It, you know, yeah. yeah. But so, yeah, like you said, I think you're right. I think you're lucky you didn't bring out a gun. I mean, yeah. Obviously, he fired the warning shot maybe closer than he intended. Right. Um, but if if he would have decided to go a different route with that because he perceived you as a threat could be a different story. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And that's the part, I guess, I, and I put that in my victim statement, that I really do have a gratitude for him because he could have killed us. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. on the deck, there's no, I mean, he had the slugs there to do it, and, and he wouldn't have any witnesses. Yeah. It could have easily just shot us both, and we, we wouldn't have anything to talk mm-hmm. about. Was he on drugs, or? I don't think he was. He didn't act, people have asked that question, too. I don't think so. I, You know, I've been around people, obviously, that are on drugs. He didn't act like it. Mm-hmm. Um. He, w- he wanted to get out of there, mm-hmm. and we had the truck that was able to get him out of there. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were the means to the end for him. Right. 